My name is Professor Bernard Agba Obeng, Associate Professor of Entrepreneurship and Small Business Management, and I have been with the Gimpa Business School for almost, I think more than 11, 12 years now. Currently, I'm the head of the business management department, and I teach courses in entrepreneurship and small business management, and specifically in the area of foundations of entrepreneurship, new venture creation, social entrepreneurship, SME management, and entrepreneurship in general. I also teach courses in, money, in marketing, especially principles of marketing, marketing management, and strategic marketing at the graduate level. Principles of marketing is under, at the undergraduate level. And in terms of my research, I research the area of entrepreneurship and small business management. So I have some one or two papers in marketing. It is an honor and a privilege to be invited to share with you some of my experiences and also maybe the knowledge that I have acquired over the years in the area of entrepreneurship and small business management. I think as Dr. Yossi indicated, they will share with you my profile, so I don't really need to go into details. But I must say that I don't just teach, I also practice and I have some one or two businesses that are still running. I also have a social project at Adafo, a small fishing community called Okansi Kope, where we are really training the fishermen to build their capacities in the area of technical and also managerial and also even recording the locations that the find fish as they go to the sea, because this is one area which is really lacking. Because the fishermen, every day they go, they find a fish in one area. The next time, they won't have a fair idea, or if a new batch is going, it's also another history together, and then sometimes they go and roam and roam and roam and come empty-handed. So we're also introducing to them some of the modern gadgets in the area of fish finding and GPS. The women, and they can see copy to especially the widows. We have started a business with them, oh, and we oh, have oh. raised money and have opened a commerce center that is run and managed by these widows. And what we do is every quarter, the money that they have realized for the three months, we share it among 43 widows in the community. So, just to say that we don't just teach, we also practice what we teach, and as we attempt to go into entrepreneurship or we are motivated to go into entrepreneurship, sometimes we shouldn't think only of the profit motivation. But the project at Okansi Kope is not a profit motivation, but to solve societal problem, where we notice that the fishermen productivity is very low because of low technology and also innovations over the years. We also observed that the widows of Okansi Kopi, sometimes even one square meal a day was a struggling for most of them. And that was the, some of the motivation that we initiated this core milling project. So sometimes you should also think about doing good for the society, creating social value. And that's the essence of social entrepreneurship. So entrepreneurship is not only just to make money for yourself, but also you can start a venture with the motivation to create value for the society. So that's a little bit of introduction about myself and yeah, what that, I... that, that's great. Okay. Uh, Prof, you mean you have an um, entrepreneur, entrepreneur, but who is an entrepreneur? Is there let's say, a clearly defined set of characteristics for is it, is it entrepreneur, somebody to be known as an entrepreneur? What do we see before we can say, yes, this, this is an entrepreneur over a period, over a short time, how do we do well, who do we classify as an entrepreneur? Okay, thank you very much for this question. I think in entrepreneurship discipline or the literature, there is indeed a distinction between somebody owning a business and also an entrepreneur. 
Definitely every entrepreneur, one or the other, will own a business. But not every owner manager can also be classified as an entrepreneur. And I think the key word in terms of who an entrepreneur is, is somebody who creates new venture, something new, bring new product to the world. And we are saying that new doesn't mean it should sometimes be new to the world, but maybe even existing product, but you can take a little bit or modify a little bit and then launch the, the product. And at the same time, you're able to succeed in expanding your business. And then we can say that this person is an entrepreneur because I can, then I, I can just simply put it that entrepreneur is somebody who creates new venture. And in the textbook definition, we, we say entrepreneur, and I will define it in relation to the concept of entrepreneurship. As somebody who identifies an opportunity and pursue those opportunity without recourse to the resources at his or her disposal. And that is key because most of the time we have wonderful ideas. We're able to identify business opportunities, but without pursuing it, you see, it will just be in your head. And in that case, that person cannot be defined or classified as an entrepreneur. So you should be able to identify an opportunity and we should be clear with this. It's about identifying opportunity and then pursuing those opportunities without thinking about the resources at your disposal. That's the, that's the, so with all the, this broad uh, frame of definition, thank you for that. Um, so how do you classify, what are the type of entrepreneurs that you have that, that is helping yes. Thank you very much for this question. In terms of the types of um, entrepreneurs that we, 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 we have, we can say that I will come, I will want to come out with this classification, two key distinct two. We Sometimes we say we have necessity entrepreneurs. Okay. We have opportunity entrepreneurs. Right. Necessity entrepreneur are sometimes those people who go into entrepreneurship as a result of necessity. It's not about opportunity identification. They have to live. Yeah. They have to survive. Yeah. And because of that, they don't have any other option. But maybe to go to the street and sell. This is also sometimes you say the salary substitute style of entrepreneurship. So such a person, the moment he secure a little bit better job offer, he leaves yeah. and follow that dream. As compared to the opportunity entrepreneur who may be employed and having a good salary, but decide to go into entrepreneurship because he or she has identified an opportunity that he thinks he can create wealth out of that opportunity, create venture out of that opportunity, and as a result of that, leave his gainfully employed job and pursue that dream. These are the people who start a venture small, and within a short time, you realize that they have been able to grow the business and employing many people. So entrepreneurs are more or less have growth ambition. Okay, they, they yes. have growth ambition. As growth ambition. Yes. Okay compared to those who go as a result of necessity. For them, it's a salary substitute. So they start a venture, they sell it on the street, but the moment they get a better job offer, they leave the street and go. That's the necessity. Mm -hmm. There are also other classifications that we can also make, or the various types in the, in the form of, let's say, immigrants entrepreneurs, like in Ghana, where people travel from China, come to Ghana to set up business, the Lebanese, the Indians, and what have you. We can also have a situation where couples, couples, for instance, couples will start a new venture. So, and also entrepreneurship can also be practiced in a large company, why we call the corporate entrepreneurship. And in that case, individuals in these companies, 
that practice entrepreneurship, the area of coming out to new products, new services, are the intrapreneurs. Intrapreneurs. So these are the various kind of classifications and types of entrepreneurs that I can give at this moment. In the beginning, you did mention a term, um, owner managers. Can you tell us a little bit about them? What what is that regional classification? What Yes, it's to, you are right to, you see, there, there are some people who really, who just own and manages a business. And this business is maybe came about as a result of not, maybe, well, there are no new ideas, new products, new services. They just manage it. Oh. And maybe let me come out, let me explain that a little bit further. You see, one of the key distinction between an entrepreneur and let's say the owner manager, entrepreneurs are innovative. Okay. So innovative or innovation is a key word. So to be classified as an entrepreneur, you have to own and manage a business, but at the same time to be innovative, constantly improving, modifying, and coming up with new products that attracts new customers and also grow your business. So an entrepreneur to someone who is innovative and also at the same time have business know-how, management skills, and business networks, you see. Owner manager may have business know-how, will have the administrative skills to manage a business, but may be less innovative. So in that case, if you are trying to define who an entrepreneur is, because he is not really, his level of innovativeness is low, we cannot classify some that person as an entrepreneur, but rather a manager, owner manager, or administrator. So you see, and, the small thing he has his own small thing. He manages to at a certain level at which he can like, exactly. Yeah, when he doesn't want to be yeah. <laughs> okay. That yes. Yeah. And maybe let me uh, expand this uh, a little bit. You see that somebody can also come out with an invention or be talented. You see. Yeah. In meaning that person has a high level of innovation. His level of innovation is high. But if that person doesn't have managerial skills, business know-how, and business network, that person cannot also be called an entrepreneur, but may be called an inventor. So not all inventors are entrepreneurs. Those who invent, and also are able to create wealth out of that invention are the people we call entrepreneurs. Okay, great. That, that's a good, a good revelation. So it's not necessarily you, you, you invent a thing and then everything, the whole thing is completely commercialized and everything. You need people to work with, you need the people, you need the managers and all. And also you made an important point that uh, uh, within corporate organizations, we have in, in, entrepreneurship sort of entrepreneurs working within that. So we will come to that when we come, we're looking at some of these other things. Now, we okay. talked a lot about, um, we talked with the type, now we know, we have a fair idea of the type. So what are the prevailing ones in this, in the, in Ghana? What, what, what is it? Because we know that culture sort of affects the way we do things and way we, do. yes. Most of our towns were built on some form of entrepreneurship. This in Sawam, Swedro, where all, towns that were built with trade sort of thing um, yes before even the this whole Accra became what it is now so how what are the prevailing things that we we, we, we do we have well i'm really not in terms of the various types the prevailing ones in yeah. our country yes okay i think i will respond by citing a work that was done by Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. 
And the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor more or less assesses the level of entrepreneurial activities in various countries. And they did a study, I think some years back, in 2014 or 2016, where they found that in Ghana, about 37% of the population are involved in entrepreneurial activity. Meaning one way or the other, these people are involved in entrepreneurship kind of work. But this study also observed that in Western countries, advanced countries like the US, the UK, Germany, and those places too, when it comes to the entrepreneurial activities of the population, the US about 10 to 12 percent, at most 15 percent, and across the developed countries, they are around this same figure. So meaning in all parts of the world, many people are involved in entrepreneurship compared to the US. But I always ask my student a question. If many people are involved in entrepreneurship and we are saying that entrepreneurs create new ventures, they help reduce food poverty. Why is it that we have very high unemployment in our part of the world? We also have high levels of poverty. Because those countries that they have less entrepreneurs, they have less of those these in, in terms of poverty, in terms of high unemployment, etc. Yeah. And I think the answer lies in terms of the type of entrepreneurship that we normally involve ourselves. And when I was trying to classify it or give the different types of entrepreneurship, I said people go into entrepreneurship as a result of necessity whereas others go as a result of opportunity identification. So coming back to that, in our part of the world, many people go into entrepreneurship as a result of necessity. And based on that, because it's not based on opportunity, it is very difficult to grow, to expand. It's most cases one man, one woman business. So such businesses are unable to grow, expand, and absorb the labor force. So, and this may be also based on a number of factors. You say in our part of the world, the entrepreneurship ecosystem, the factors, when I say the ecosystem, the factors that promote entrepreneurship are really not well developed in our part of the world. The ecosystem is not well developed. So, in the, but in the Western countries, the factors are really well developed. So even, we say that in Silicon Valley, every stupid idea that a person will come out will fly. Okay, okay. okay. yeah. You see, to help you to succeed. Yeah. But in our part of the world, we really don't have those kind of support system. You have great ideas. You only really need a small funding even for a relative to come on board, sometimes it's very difficult. Yes. Yes. We, we, we may not have all the technical, all the skills, the business know-how, and even in terms of innovation, which is key to entrepreneurship. Because yes. of yes. the form of education, the cultural factors, we are less innovative. We don't question. And we don't challenge That's assumptions. <laughs> We, we accept it. Whatever we are told, we accept. Yeah, but yeah. to prevent it, sometimes you have to challenge. You have to question existing assumptions. We have to be, in a way, antisocial. Let me put it this way. A little bit antisocial. To go outside the comfort zone. But these are some of the limitations. But I think one thing that I learned, and Peter Draca made a statement that, even if you are less innovative, the good news is that innovation can be learned and practiced. We can learn and practice and improve upon your level of innovativeness and as a result, put ideas and then launching very innovative businesses. Good, good. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. Now, we, uh, we, we, in this um, model, we, we, we uh, 
we are actually speaking to supporters and um, those who support um, NBSSI and NEI. Exactly. Yes, it, uh, that's how we are going to, to talk. Yeah, that's the ecosystem, but they are part of the ecosystem, the ecosystem that I was talking about. They are coming up with some fantastic ideas and people can do their own business and try and then use it as their, and use the one year national service um, for, for, for that to help develop the idea and the government, they can they register with the government to be paid the national service and they will use that one year to do to do to sort of polish up the ideas and that sort of those are some of the new uh, ideas that N E I P um N I N E I N E National Entrepreneurship Innovation, Innovation Program. Program. And yes, yes, they are doing their best. I've been following them. I mean yeah. apart from them, we have NBSS to National Board for Small Scale yeah. Industry, yeah. also the government arm. Um, that aims at promoting enterprise development like the NEIP. Yeah. We also have some of our private sector organizations like the Joy FM, the City FM, and a number of NGOs that have come out various initiatives, like have the TechnoSev, for instance. We have we have Magdan Entrepreneurship Challenge. Business Plan Challenge. Yeah. Challenge. We have Young African Leadership Initiative, YALI, which yes. is funded by USID and the British government funding engine business plan competition, which is really organized by TechnoSafe under the engine initiatives. So we have a number of, apart from the government sector, even the private sector organization, NGOs, they're all coming up with various innovative, you know, initiatives to surprise to support enterprise development in our country yeah. Yeah. and I, i'm glad to say that because i'm actually i've spoken to um mr uh, kelvin atubuga the guy who runs the foundation for Mazan. and um, we, we've spoken to him what and then also uh, nbssi um uh, madame philomena uh, the director of entrepreneurship, yes, for some discussions yeah. and also Mr. Kirkery and all that. Uh, for okay, that, that that's very good. That's what we we have now. So the question is, okay, now with the current environment, my question, the question is, why do I have to start my own business with all those um, different types of entrepreneurship? I can still work for somebody. I can still do whatever I want to do. So why do I have to start my own business? from your we need some advice from you as to okay i think there are various motivations for people going to entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and the first one is some people want to be their own bosses they don't want to work for anybody i want to be my own boss i want to work for myself others decide to leave their gainfully employed jobs to pursue their own dreams I think I have identified a business opportunity and I think I should pursue this opportunity to make a difference in the world. Yeah. Some yeah. people are forced to go into entrepreneurship because they realize that maybe they have certain skills and knowledge set that they can really come out with a better product or a service than what is currently available. And based on that, they just launch their own business. I've not mentioned about money, though that's the end result. Because globally, I can say that all billionaires in this world, and even in all parts of the world, work for themselves. Yeah, they, 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 they don't, don't work, work for anybody. They don't work for end of the the month salary. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> they work for themselves. Yeah. You see, and even in our part, we have a number of rich people who really started something small, and today they are hiring or they are employing many people. But I'm not saying that. You want to be rich, so I go and start a new venture. Yeah. You see, if you start a business with that kind of thinking and the mindset, you are likely to fail. Okay. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. You see, that for me, 
this business I'm starting, I have to get my first car. You'll fail. You'll never get a first car. Because you try to use shortcut means you will not satisfy your customers well because your motivation is to make money. So, and Peter Drucker made a statement, Peter always cool. He said that the purpose of every business is to create a customer. He didn't say to create money. It's to create a customer because without a customer, there is no business. So why don't you think about doing something good, changing the world? Then it is out of that good thing that you did, the money will come. So don't think money first, but think about satisfying the customer, making the customer happy. I watched a Gates interview some years back when he left BBC, when he left Microsoft and decided to focus his attention on the foundation. his foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And BBC interviewed him and asked him just simple question, Mr. Gates, what was your secret of success? success? He said two things. The first one he said was his ability to manage the team. Yeah. Those part of his staff or the management team with the management background and the other part with the engineering background, trying to bring them together to come out with something good. The second point he made was that when we started Microsoft, we were not thinking about money. We were thinking about coming out with a great product. So at the initial stages, we were giving even the software free of charge. We were asking customers, give us whatever you want to give us. But when people use the software and realize that it was solving their problems, they followed it and it is after that Microsoft decided to dictate the terms of the business. Are, are you getting the point yes. I'm making? Yes. So, you see, yes, you want to go into business to make money, but that shouldn't be your number one motivation. Think about doing customer or creating customer first, creating something valuable that people will appreciate. And it is after that that the money will follow. As an academic, I um, some market analysis thing and I ask myself, how many businesses, how many people actually calculate customer lifetime value? That's the point. <laughs> even, even that is taught, it's just taught as a concept in the classroom, but how many people yes. have to do that idea? Yes, That's the point. <laughs> <laughs> How many people can customer yeah. If you miss this person, what are you missing? What are you really missing? That's the thing. Yes, okay. because so, the point is that if you serve the customer well, the customer will always come to you. You are able to establish that long-term relationship. You are able to build that loyalty base. And that is when you start making money from your product service or the idea that you have generated. Thank you for that. Now, okay, um, so now that we, we're looking at starting our business, the whole idea is look, getting a, a, a customer list. I mean, making a customer, getting it. And so what are some of the challenges in starting your own business? We already have, we're talking to some of the technical people. We've also talked to some uh, entrepreneurs who have started their business and uh, about how to start a small business in Ghana and in one of the sessions and they've given us some details on that. But from your perspective, as uh, somebody practicing it, also as an academic, how has, what are some of the challenges? And surprisingly, they also say that finance is really not the main thing. Well, yes, but still too, when yes, you talk to most of them too, <laughs> yes. they will say, well, fin finance and what have you. <laughs> yeah. They, 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 but but it's not always the case. There may be other, sometimes maybe lack of technical skill. And even getting the right people to work with is a key. Yeah, yeah. Now we are saying we have high unemployment, but I can assure you, many people are also looking for 
qualified people to hire, and they are not getting. Yeah, that, so that's, that's, that's getting the right skilled labor is a key challenge. Yes, so uh, yes. There are a lot of people in the system are unemployable, not because uh, they are unemployed, because they are unemployable, because they, even they are, the, the skill sets that they bring to the place is, has its own challenges. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Another challenge may be sometimes government policies that may be frustrating in a way in the area of maybe, let's say, transitions, for instance. Yeah. Because if you are saying startups are struggling, really, to raise funding, why then do you expect such a struggling business to pay tax the first year of operation. You see? Because, because you want to run a formalized business, when you, you register your business with the registry general, previously this will also be even registering your business used to be a challenge, but today I have experienced it. I think within 24, at most 48 hours, if you are registering your business as an enterprise, you should get your certificate. So these days, they have really streamlined the registration processes. But in the area of, let's say, taxation, you register your business with GRE. Immediately you register your business, they ask you to give in terms of an estimate of your annual revenue, and then based on that, you to pay a certain portion of it. You see, and, and these things, as you are struggling to yes. make money to start the business, it, it and the business that you have not even made a penny, he started telling you to. So it's another that's part of it. Yeah. Infrastructure, for instance. You see, you want to start a business. In elsewhere, they have government kind of like incubation centers or workstations where you can pay something small and set up your office. And you provide them with those various support that you need as a startup. Yes. And uh, you're able to grow your business and decide to go and rent a place of your own. We don't have such facility. And uh, maybe some institutions, private sector, have set up these incubation centers. But as a government policy or initiatives, we really don't have. And other areas in terms of inadequate information, because government is coming out very number of initiatives, like the national service issue that we are talking about, that you can really start your own business and do the national service in your own company. Yeah. You see, yeah. how many even are aware of this? It was only when I spoke to him that he just said, I said, no, but it's a great idea. But what, how have you promoted this whole idea? You see, and even as a startup, I think the government has been willing to subsidize the salaries of your new employees. Yes. But yes. how many people are away? So these are very good initiatives that are really on paper. Market access to markets will sometimes be a big challenge because of the open market system. But I also like the idea of free market because it always brings in our level of innovativeness so that as you, are, you compete with others, you are constantly aiming at improving what you do with the objective of creating more value for your customers. But compare our market size list in Nigeria, for instance, you see a handicap. We have this ECOWAS protocol that it, you should be able to sell your, your product, your service to almost anybody within the ECOWAS sub-region. Is, is it working? So these are some of the practical challenges. And uh, another area in terms of the, our skill set as entrepreneurs ourselves, you see, sometimes we may not have it all, but one thing we have to note is that if you start a new venture, not with a team, but yourself, you should know that you should have skill set in finance. Okay. You should have some basic skills in marketing. You should have some basic skills in project management. You should have some big basic skills in supply chain. Because as the founder, owner, manager, you perform all these functions. 
you should have skills in managing your working capital. And this is one of the reasons why many entrepreneurs complain they don't have money. Sometimes they may have enough, but because of the lack of skills in working capital management, they are unable to manage the little resources they have to their advantage. So they will always complain. Utility bills, another aspect of it, water, light is very expensive. And even the utility infrastructure itself is not really well developed. Access to water, poor road network, which is the infrastructure aspect. There are all some of the challenges that entrepreneurs or startups really encounter. And then, uh, well, there, there, there is, but the challenge is that this is what we have. So um, how do we navigate that in this part of the world? That's a thing. That's what I, I want. Yes, because there is always a way out. That is why we say to be an entrepreneur, you should be creative and you should be innovative. Yeah. Without that aspect, you will struggle to succeed. Because of the number of problems that we have in our part of the world, your level of creativity will always help you to work around these challenges that you face along the way. Like inadequate funding or lack of skills, labor. There is always a way around it. We have this concept of bootstrapping. Okay. If you are starting a new venture, you don't necessarily have to go and rent an expensive office space in a high street or in a market place or whatever. You can start from your home, even your bedroom, yeah, your bedroom depending on the nature the of the business. Yes, yeah, because uh, uh, somebody is using their garages, all these um, things. Exactly. Everything to start their business. Exactly. HP and all, them, all that, their father's garage. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Many successful entrepreneurs started along those lines. Mm -hmm. You see, you should also be able to take advantage of your network, the people you know, what we call the social capital, to be able to get access to resources. Maybe I don't have money to buy these raw materials, but the supplier or the seller of these raw materials is a friend to my friend or my brother. Okay. Why don't you use that relationship to get these raw materials on credit? Yeah. And after you have sold, you take your profit and you pay back. That's the social capital that, you are talking that, about. That, 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 that's exactly what the entrepreneurs are saying. Exactly. Sometimes you need this particular equipment, but you don't have the money to buy. Why don't you lease? Or why don't you buy a second hand? If that one will reduce your cost by 60, 70 percent for a start. So you should always, as a starter, always try to improvise. Yes, you should start small and then exactly literature events in entrepreneurship and small business. We're talking about like small starting small, and also in the areas that you raise the skill set. They, Sometimes the skill sets required to start will not be the skill set. It's slightly different from the skill set to grow the business, to maintain it, and you have to have exactly. It. And even to add to in the area of skill set, definitely maybe you may need legal advice. You may need maybe a financial advice or analyst or somebody. But you see, you have a friend who is a lawyer. You have a friend who is an accountant. Why don't you constitute what we call board of advisors? So that any time you need some professional advice for a particular profession or area, you contact those people. Yes. That's you see? So these are some of the basic techniques that can help you to, to work around the challenges that may come your way because you don't have that huge amount of capital to start your business. Maybe you started a business, even your first customers, who are they? Most of the time, the first customers should be those in your social network. Those yeah. who know you. Yeah. Yeah. And today, yeah. we have this social media. That's 
sometimes if you don't pay anything that you can post on your Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram. And gradually, as people experience your product or service, they enjoy it, they tell their friends. Their friends then tell their friends and you expand your market base. So there is always around the challenges that come our way as entrepreneurs or as Good. Good. Okay. Just add that the next question actually we, we've spoken a little bit up. We've some we have taken part of it like we, we're looking at why like Ghanaian companies are not large, they're not classified as large scale uh, or multinational big companies. There are few others have gone uh, uh, into other countries and have branches and other uh, subsidiaries in other countries, but generally they are generally small uh, not large business. And the question is why? You said that generally we have a lot of um, necessity entrepreneurs. Most uh, out of that 37 percent, most of them are necessity entrepreneurs. Is that why we are having this or the other issues such as the net ecosystem not being favorable for developing that? Okay, thank you very much. I think yes, your first point is maybe one of the reasons. Because many people that go into entrepreneurship do not necessarily have that kind of or identify an opportunity. They go there as, as a result of necessity. But even those who identified opportunity and started a business and have graduated from even maybe startups, how many find it difficult to graduate from startup to growth oriented business? You see. Because if you're able to graduate from startup to growth or rented, then you'll be expanding, expanding, and you become maybe a large scale business. Like we have Casapa, for instance. They started small. And this chemist started small. But today, they're almost all over the world of West Africa, operating in the South region. I think some of the challenges is that we don't want to partner, have it all myself. You see? But sometimes you have a limitation. Though you are the founder, mm -hmm. but you have the limit, the, the maximum that you can go in terms of growing the business. But because you are not ready to share or even to be a vice president in your own company, you continue to maintain that small pie that you have started. And I always use Google, the founders of Google, these two gentlemen, Sergio and the, I think Larry Page, or, these two gentlemen are PhD holders, who, but still they are vice presidents in their own country, in their own company. Yes. That's it. That's the they brought in somebody, Eric Smith. You see, yeah, to lead them in their growth prospects. And today, where is Google? But how many Ghanaians will be willing to be a vice president in his or her own company? We don't want to partner. We are sometimes afraid to bring others on board. Maybe they may have a general reasons also. And another issue has to be, especially, you know, most of our businesses to have family businesses. But there is this element of lack of succession planning. We don't think about who succeeds us. And sometimes at a point, you continue to run the business at a point that you realize that you are weak. You are getting closer to your grave. And still, you don't want to give up. And you don't want to prepare somebody, to train somebody to take over from you. So the moment the founder dies, he dies with the business. So only few businesses have been able to graduate, especially family businesses, from one generation to the other. And that's also one of the key reasons that we don't have multinationals and large scale, many large scale businesses in our part of the country. You've led us nicely to the second, the next question about the challenges of family business, which is that I had the opportunity of looking at the PhD work on 
effect of family conflict on family business sustainability. And I realized that we don't even have a lot of literature in that area on in this part of the world, like in Ghana. The best is talking about Ghana, but they, we don't even have literature to, I mean, the family structure, the, the definitions. Are you using um, the extended from the Western family size uh, uh, definition or the extended Ghanaian family size? Because the person, uh, cousins, cousins, can be all considered as part of the family. Yes, but yes, uh, just give us a little bit of the challenges of family business entrepreneurs, and then we we can move on to the next. I think you have mentioned the issue of conflicts among siblings, but even sometimes too, there are conflicts between or among the family members of the founder, and also even sometimes on employees of the company who think they started a business and this should succeed the founder. And all this comes up to the issue of lack of succession work, planning. Because if you have planned very well, sometimes it's possible that you may not even find somebody within the family to lead the company because maybe none of your siblings is interested. So you bring somebody from outside to take it over, especially in a situation where you have gone public. And if you're in a public limited liability company, in that case, you may not even have that say. It's the shareholders who dictate. But what about the private limited liability companies? You see, in that case, you really need to prepare somebody to take charge. And I think Casa Prepon is an example. They have really, the founder has really prepared somebody to take, one of, I think, his sons to take charge. Okay. Mechanical so, Lloyd is also yes. a typical family yes. business. Exactly, yes. And, that was the example I wanted to give. I came across early before. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mechanical, yeah. Is, mechanical Lloyd is also another family yeah. business that has really graduated from one generation to the other. But the issues about the conflict is a key challenge. Yeah. And sometimes, too, especially if you are a, a very young business startups, there are issues, especially if the entrepreneur, the founder is a woman, managing house affairs and activities with the business, the husband issues. There are always issues in terms of the time management, balancing. So some of them, at a point, they just give up. Okay. And yeah. our, cultural, our cultural factors may also be another issues. Our belief system, as a woman, for instance, if the woman, the business is was founded by a woman, and you will say, as a woman, you have to sit home and your husband has to go and work and bring money. So why don't you even allow the husband to run the business? Yeah. Instead of you. Yeah. But maybe the husband may not have that skill set to run the business. <laughs> you run it down and collapse it. Yes, it's the truth. It's the truth. The person may, may be the husband, but doesn't have the skill set. The whether it's the exactly, the exactly. Mm -hmm. And even going for a loan, if a woman entrepreneur going for a facility, sometimes becomes a challenge. Yeah. Because sometimes the banks will ask you for a collateral. And because women normally don't inherit, uh -huh. it's yeah. very difficult. Okay. Yeah. So there are a number of challenges when it comes to family businesses, and essentially to where the man has maybe two or three wives. Wow. Yeah. So he has kids from different mothers. Who do you prepare to succeed you? So you see, the moment the founder passes on, focal transport is a typical example. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I was just about to, yes. You see, definitely did not prepare anybody to take charge. He had a number of companies, but the moment he passed, what happened? They sold their various companies, assets, and today there's nothing to write home he was about. The mega, a big the transport company in those days, even before yes. we did OA and all that's coming, they were, Coco Transport was, was one of the main things. 
good. So yeah. I think we covered most of the questions. Now we will want to, yes, just nicely dove into it. Any advice for students who have small businesses and startups? Because generally we know that some of the students all have their own small thing running, yes, and some of the things, yes. And then also those who are studying, the, the thing is as to what advice for you as they study or those who are going to listen to this course later on. What are the things that, any advice for them? Okay, thank you. I think all that I will add to help what I've said already is that the first, they should think big, but start small. That's one. Second, they should think customer first, but not money first. Meaning, always try to come out with something of value. Always try to satisfy your customers. And it is only when the customer becomes happy, then the money will follow. So think customer first, not money. And always try to establish that long-term relationship with your customers. Be creative and innovative. Because Schumpeter made a statement some many years ago that innovation is the key to competitive survival. If you start a business and want to survive, you need to constantly improve upon your product and services in order to stay relevant or else somebody will be coming out a better product than you and you'll be out of business. Kodak, the photograph people, look at where they are now. They used to be mega now. But exactly. Now, with the mobile phones. Coming. Nokia. No, yes, Nokia, yes. Yeah. <laughs> First mobile phone was Nokia. I mean, <laughs> it was yes. mobile phone was Nokia. Yes. Yeah. So innovation is key. You are not saying you should come up with something new to the world, Nobel, but continuously improve upon what you do, the services you provide, so that you always create value for your end users, meaning your customers. And, and I, I, I think, yes, maybe this is all that I will ask my student to really maybe consider yeah. those who are already into it or those who are thinking of going into entrepreneurship. Okay. Thank you very, very much for your advice and for all that you've shared with us. We know we are going to meet you in class and in other courses of entrepreneurship as we move forward in level, in the upper level in the school and know that. And we're going to get more of the details of that. Thank you very much. You are welcome and also thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my ideas and experiences with the students. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.